So this webinar will be available on the PA Museum's website um, for future access for people who weren't able to join us today. So again, welcome everybody. And I'm just gonna start off with a bit of a history of the project. So um, this started off in October of 2019. Um, this was a Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, a National Museum Leadership Grant. And um, we really divided things up into, into three phases. The goal was to design and pilot a self-assessment program through which museums can establish their accessibility baseline and work to meet national standards for inclusion. Um, and we, we really did this by, by starting off in three phases. Um, and I just want to pause here for a minute. I see that Emily, who's our, our captioner today, has posted a link in the chat. So that is a way to access the captions. We aren't able to integrate them through Zoom today, but you can click on that link to view the captions. And for those viewing the recording, um, we will work those captions into the recording as well. So <clears throat> the project phase started out, our first work was doing a lot of research, finding out what these national standards for inclusion in the field are, um, and really building up the, the knowledge base of our project teams, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, this project was also piloted in, after we had developed an initial working draft. Um, we did a pilot with our partners at the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission's Bureau of Historic Sites wow. and Museums. And um, that really allowed us to kind of test out what at the time was very much a working document. So is this is this working for for our our clients um, for museums in the field and really looking at, at different types of organizations. Um, this is definitely not designed to be any sort of one size fits all. And that was where we really found out that this emphasis on creating a more modular program. Um, because we were a national leadership grant, this is designed to be usable by any type of organization. I actually saw on the registration that we have some, some folks from libraries or some folks who are independent accessibility professionals in here. That is amazing. I'm so glad that you're, that you're joining us today. Um, so the final phase was where we were basically taking the learnings from the pilot and adapting this tool and saying, okay, what did we what did we learn testing this out? And how can we make this more user friendly, expanding, um, and really thinking about access as a stepping stone to inclusion. Um, we, we had a partner that was we were working with in the earlier phases of the project, um, Cecile Shellman, she's an independent museum consultant. And her her tagline and a quote, if you read her blog ever, is inclusion is never done. Um, this this is not an end goal. This is a process, and we really wanted to make sure that we honor that in in this toolkit. That this is something that is 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 never done. We're constantly working towards, um, but it's also very rewarding. So just to give a little background on who, who the people were that developed this, um, it was a pretty, pretty sizable team. Um, a couple of the folks who were on this team are here at the webinar today. Um, Rusty, who is the other, the other big piece of PA Museums, the executive director, um, and myself, as well as a number of uh, staff from the Pennsylvania Bureau of Historic Sites and Museums. So this is everything from museum maintenance staff, educators, curators, um, director level folks. So really looking at um, and, and taking to heart this principle of accessibility is everyone's job and making sure we have a voice from all levels of staff in the process. And we'll, we'll talk about the importance and what we learned in there later. Um, the other piece of the puzzle was our Accessibility Excellence Advisory Committee. And this is made up of disability um, and accessibility professionals from across the, both, both in Pennsylvania and across the country. So this is really kind of looking at that intersection of, dis of lived experience, 
and also practical experience. And um, so really looking, making sure that we are um, honoring both museum professionals as the people who will be using this at the end and also um, thinking about who are the, who are who are the visitors who will be affected by that um, who are people with lived experience of disability um, and hold on one second Just to somebody to So the, the other major piece of the partnership was working with Centers for Independent Living. They were our major partners in um, really bringing in a lot of that voices of lived experience. And so as you can see here, what we're showing here is a map of um, Centers for Independent Living across the state of Pennsylvania. But this is actually um, Centers for Independent Living are nationally based. So if you are in a different state, um, you will have Centers for Independent Living available in your region. And these are really valuable partners um, by the federal mandate. If if you may not be familiar with um, SILS as they're known, um, they are organizations that are designed to serve people with disabilities um, but also by their mandate need to be made up of more than 51% of each center's staff are also people with disabilities. So there's a great combination of lived experience intersecting with professional experience when you're working with centers for independent living. Um, and basically when we went out and did all of our pilot tests, we were working with different regional cells. So we were really matchmaking museums with their local um, folks with disabilities in their region. Um, and this could be either Center for Independent Living staff or consumers. Um, the other focus for these organizations is on community involvement. So a lot of times they would know of someone who was interested in volunteering at a museum or site or might be interested in being a, a potential board member. So this is really a great opportunity for matchmaking and highly recommended. So um, I mentioned a little earlier about the pilot phase and talking about that we piloted at 20 different museums and historic sites, but here we've got a little bit of an idea of exactly what we were talking about here for some of you who might be from out of state or um, not as familiar as with the sites and museums in the system. Um, we're talking about everything from the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum up in the northern part of the state, um, the Erie Maritime Museum, which also includes a reproduction of the HMS Brig Niagara, um, historic house museums, industrial history museums, um, as well as kind of more, more traditional kind of collections in a non-historic building, um, museums like the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania Military Museum. Um, however, we were mostly focusing most of these sites are small to medium sized. So we did partner with a number of um, member organizations from PA museums that are either a little bit larger in size um, and staff and budget, um, but also or might be a different area of focus. So for example, a children's museum or an art museum um, to get some perspectives from, from places that, that weren't in the more kind of historic site or history museum mold. So uh, Jenny, this is Janet. Um, there yeah. is a question from Stephanie Williams about the colors of the um, numbered items on the map. Did that have a specific purpose? Ah, that is a <laughs> that is a good question. Um, this is actually a map that is coming from the um, a lot of these sites are branded as the the trails of history. I believe 
this corresponds to those individual trails? Janet, you might be able to answer that question better than I. Um, actually, this is the first time I'm seeing the map, so I'm actually not that sure. <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. We'll look into that and I'll, um, if I have an answer for you on that, I'll email you back. How does that sound? <laughs> um, all right. So, whoops. Um, but basically, for, for my purposes, having that map was just kind of to show where these sites were across the state. Um, like they weren't all in Philadelphia, for example. Um, so looking at the, the kind of full process. So as I was mentioning earlier, we really wanted to focus on keeping this very modular. Um, so say if you're with a museum that's been doing a lot of accessibility work already, but you're looking for something to, to kind of add your toolkit or you're at a particular phase in the process um, and you found part of this would be helpful, that's great. If you're also just starting out and you really want something that would get you through the full, how, how, to, be, how to take your organization kind of up a couple steps in accessibility, um, the aim is that we do have, we do have all or most of the pieces um, for you there. So if you look at this um, kind of chart diagram, we're divided into roughly three phases. So the first phase is um, we've got kind of a, a red dot that's kind of flow charting into another dot and into a third dot with a big overarch. Um, it says organizational reflection over it. And I'll, I'll kind of get started with that organizational reflection piece. So as we were developing this, we really realized that doing accessibility work, doing any kind of DEIA or inclusion work almost always involves a lot of organizational change. So part of, part of the grant and part of this process is saying, okay, how can we, how can we support organizations? Um, and as museums, you know, we're, we're, we like history. We like the thing, the way that things have always been. Um, but also change is good. And to do this work, you need to change the status quo. And we're seeing a lot of change in the field right now. So what we're really working on is we really wanted to make sure that we had some pieces in this toolkit that could be used at any phase of the process to help organizations reflect, support that change, kind of look internally and say, okay, is this, is this something that we're, we're struggling with because we, we just, it, it's not a good fit for our organization or it's not a good fit for our culture? And how can we change that culture and support that cultural change? So, but really the, the first part of this process is figuring out that baseline, like I mentioned earlier, where are we at right now at this particular moment in time? And that was really where we focused a lot of the effort. Um, so if you'll notice here under this, under this assess circle, there are a list of ADA checklist, accessibility audit, self-study maturity model, workbook, um, user expert site visit. So there's, there's a lot going into this assessment. It's not just filling out a checklist and boom, you're done. That was our, our initial pilot. And we realized we need to break this down into smaller pieces. This needs to be more digestible. So that's why it looks like there's a lot there, but you're really seeing a lot of different, different modules. Um, the next phase is this prepare phase, which is really where you're thinking about, okay, you found the baseline. Now, how do you get ready to take that action? So we have a piece in here, it's called the, the action planning template. So how do you really write that action plan down and get it in concrete paper form that also builds in some accountability? Um, this is also the time where you really start working with partners and make sure you're, you're involving partners in the very early stages of any planning. And this is also the time where, you know, if you came across in something in that assessment phase and you weren't really sure what it meant or it was it was something where you're like, hey, we're going to need to do a little more research before we figure out what that looks like for us. Um, that's where we have resource guides available. And I'll talk a little bit about more those more, but they go into to great depth 
um, for different areas of accessibility and different areas of museum work. And then, of course, the final stage that we call implement is how do you do the work? OK, now you've talked about it. You've planned for it. Go ahead, go out there and start getting things done. So <clears throat> this is our project website. I've got a, a QR code in the corner if you want to use that to scan. Um, if you just want to go directly to the URL, it is www.pamuseums.org slash accessibility hyphen excellence. And um, this is this is really where everything lives. And I see that Janet has put that in the chat, the link as well. So thank you very much. So this is this is really where everything is laid out. Um, this is our very first landing page that you will see that I've got a screen capture on here. And the, the kind of main navigation and how I'm going to be going through the individual pieces in the toolkit is through um, this right hand sidebar that's kind of our, our navigation hub so it includes information about the history acknowledgements um, some organizational reflection pieces um, but also really the full the full toolkit all of the different modules um, some of which are web pages and some of which are pdfs or documents or an excel spreadsheet so let's dig in. Um, the first real piece, and, and if you're just starting out on your accessibility journey, where we really recommend starting out is in our maturity models. So these are um, different documents. Um, in this case, you're seeing one of the PDFs that we've developed. And the idea is really that we've got four levels here that we're talking about. Emerging level, which is basically, okay, we, we're, we're just starting this out. We don't really know what we need to do for accessibility, but we know we should be accessible. We want to do better. Um, the second phase, which is the basic level, I'm sorry, the second level, which is basic, is um, this is really talking about legal legal requirements um, meeting with the Americans with Disabilities Act um, making sure that people can get in the building can use the restrooms um, that programs are communicated in an accessible way um, <clears throat> this is this is really the the bar um, that we're expecting most museums to be at as places of public accommodations under the ADA, but also we recognize, and, and this was something that came up a lot in our process, was recognizing that, yes, in a perfect world, the ADA has been around for over 30 years. Museums should be here, but a lot of them aren't. So that was why we made the emerging, um, but really the goal is as you're filling this out, think about if you're not meeting basic, that should be your first priority in any section. Um, and then really thinking about the good and the better, the two higher tiers are really, honestly, for us as a field right now, our field is probably mostly at basic and good. Um, so these are really aspirational, thinking about, okay, where are museums that are really, really doing things well? What are the practices that they're doing? And or what are what are things that we've heard from people with disabilities to say, hey, wouldn't it be great if. And we really tried to put those into our good and better levels of maybe this isn't everywhere in the field right now, but we should be pushing towards that. And so what you're seeing here is um, the buildings and ground maturity model. We do have seven of them total. So um the first one is about outreach so really looking at from from an external focus to an internal focus so outreach this one you're seeing here buildings core visitor experience special events and programs interpretive process documents and policies and staff support and human resources is the final one so also thinking about how we support how how accessible is our, our is our staff policy how accessible are our office spaces um, thinking about museum staff as 
accessibility consumers as well as our visitors. And also, as, as we um, have kind of framed these, recognizing that different museums can be in different places. So you might have really accessible buildings and grounds, but your programs aren't that accessible, or you could do better in staff policies. Um, so this that's that's kind of part of this too is recognizing that different different areas of of your organization might be in different places. And that's totally normal. So the other piece that kind of works in tandem with this is our workbook, and this is where um, we kind of split up from looking at really bigger themes that can apply to all or most cultural organizations, museums, historic sites, and kind of digging into more specific elements of that. So um, what we're, we're looking at here is um, some pages from the leadership and budget section of the workbook. And this basically outlines, so some of them, not all of them have what they call a big picture concept, and then we'll outline different um, examples from different levels. So what does something look like on a better level at a small volunteer run historic site? What does something look like on an emerging level at a large art museum? What does something look like at a good level in a library? Um, and then so giving giving these examples of very more specific situations to kind of answer that question of okay you're talking about having having a welcoming environment what is what does a welcoming environment look like um, what are some examples of that so I can better understand as a staff member does my museum have a welcoming environment or not um, or what are some things that we might aim for and um, then all of the sections include a kind of workbook page of giving some space for staff or a, a group of staff members, a group of volunteers, your board even, to start thinking about, okay, where are we now? And also how might we move forward to the next level? <clears throat> um, another part of this, the, the kind of first assess phase is looking at um, and bringing bringing other people in so self assessment is great, but there are certain times where you just need to get that extra set of eyes on the problem and just get get some fresh perspectives. So we incorporated two areas um, for potential potential outside outsider input. Um, the first is what we call an accessibility audit. So that's where um, this could be an independent consultant. This could be a staff member from your local center for independent living who that's that's their area of focus is doing these audits at different at different businesses or, or different residential areas. Um, and really looking at this is really more thinking about compliance. So is our building accessible? Do our bathrooms meet ADA standards? Are our case heights accessible? Things like that. Um, and the idea is that this would this would happen pretty early on in the process, um, just to kind of have that that outsider perspective contributing to your baseline. The second visit, um, which is what we're calling the user expert site visit, this is a chance to maybe after you've done, done the maturity model, brought in um, a staffer from a, from a SIL to do your accessibility audit, kind of had a chance to digest the findings and think about, okay, where we're at, maybe brainstorm a few ideas, or even if it's something that's a real easy change, you know, okay, hey, we've, we've, we moved this case that was interfering with our wheelchair lift to get up into an inaccessible part of the site. Um, and so this is when you can invite people who have a lived experience with disability and really shift from answering the question of, is our site, is our museum, is our building, is our landscape accessible to 
is it effective um, if your main way of interpreting your site or your organization to a visitor is a tour? Let's go on your tour, see how that works out. Um, and, and does this really the, I'm sure some of you might've heard the ADA, the big hallmark is effective communication for people with disabilities. So is your tour effectively communicating to someone who might be deaf or hard of hearing? Um, is it effective for someone who's blind, someone on the autism spectrum, um, someone who uses a wheelchair? So really getting a chance to get that kind of first person, um, really personal feedback. Um, but we also have, so the, the layout of this is a little bit different than when you're dealing with someone who's just looking at it from kind of an, is this accessible standpoint, recognizing that you're gonna get some very personal feedback. And sometimes this can be something you can use immediately. Sometimes this might be like, okay, well, we're, we're, we've got some feedback, we've identified an issue, the solution that this person wants to see might be outside of our budget, but how can we kind of brainstorm a way to think about the solution in that way? Um, sometimes like if you if you do a lot of focus groups, your organizations, this would be basically just a, a focus group with people with disabilities. Um, but if you've never done one of those before, we kind of provide a lot of things like a sample agenda, some ground rules, um, some reflection questions to, to get you started. Or if you've already got a process for that, go for it. So <clears throat> the last kind of big piece and really transitioning into this, the next repair phase are um, two big pieces. The first is our action planning template. So that is this Excel spreadsheet that you see along the bottom of this slide. Um, it says accessibility action plan for organization name and has a, a long landscape table with a lot of columns in it. That's planned action, assessment category, priority. Um, so this is really a big planning document to think about, okay, everything we've talked about in the meeting, every kind of the comments that came up as we were doing the maturity model or notes that we wrote in the workbook or comments that we heard from a site visit. Um, how are we going to actually put those into action? Um, because a lot of times, sure, it's something you can do in, in five minutes and excellent problem solved. But a lot of times these these changes do involve looking for additional funding or Maybe it's something you need more feedback from, from visitors, like you've talked to one person in a wheelchair, but you've talked to one person in a wheelchair. So how to get some more group feedback of, of what could make a really effective solution. Um, who's gonna be doing it? Um, what's, what's, what's the person that's gonna be responsible for this? When is it gonna be done? Um, who are you gonna be partnering with to do it? Um, how much is it gonna cost? Uh, really making sure that breaking breaking all of this down um, and really thinking about you know how can we how can we make sure that we've we've got all this covered. Um, this is also something that is important for legal compliance under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, where if you do get yourself find find yourself in a situation where um, there, there is a complaint or you're hearing from someone who is, is um, potentially going to make a Department of Justice complaint through the ADA that they found something that is not accessible to them. Um, by having something like this in, in your organization's files that staff are working on, that's what your way of saying, you know, yes, we understand this is an issue. It is not accessible right now, but here are all the things that we're doing to make it happen and if it's something that's like a big building change you can have a date and say look we're, we're aiming to do this by this or yes we're looking to do that but we don't currently have funding for it here's here's the grant funders that we're looking for uh, and that's that's just a way to to be be honest about you know this is this is a process yes we should do better yes we know we should do better here's how we're doing the work 
Um, and just a note about this date range and cycles. And I saw that Janet also put a note in the chat about this is all open source. Yes, the idea behind this being an Excel spreadsheet is that you can customize it, you can delete fields, you can add new fields, um, really make this your own. Um, and the whole um, the whole um, modules, all of the modules are also open source and modifiable as well. Um, so even though those maturity models did come in, in PDFs, we also have a separate version that's just a Word document. So if you want to put them in a different format, go for it. Um, so talking about the cycles of the plan, so this was kind of designed in a way that um, by being de designed by museum staff, we're really understanding that having one whole document that lists everything that you you want to do or you need to do can be a lot. Mm -hmm. So breaking it down into smaller pieces. So for example, okay, let's let's look at what's going to be done in this current strategic plan. What's going to be done in our current exhibition cycle? What, what can we do this program year um, and and really breaking it down also that allows it to be if you're in a larger organization. Um, this can be developed by maybe your program team or your development department. Um, if you're in a smaller museum, then it's probably your whole team doing each of these but um but that way there's there's a bit of flexibility so it's not just also it's not all just on one person hey you're our accessibility coordinator fill out this plan for our entire museum um we do not encourage that at all um this this needs to be something that is is ideally done by multiple people in a collaborative way um, so up above the action planning template, you will see our resource guides. And as with the maturity model, we have a number of these that focus on very specific roles. Um, but also the first two are kind of more broad, really starting points. Um, the first one, 10 things you can do for free or low cost, is really recognizing that a lot of museums have very small budgets, have no budgets, might be very large, but your department might be extremely under-resourced. So what are some things that you can do for free or for very inexpensively? Um, that that is something that's useful to all of us. And the second one is really thinking about getting started. So, oh my God, you've seen this list, you're overwhelmed. Start with this guide. <laughs> and this will at least give you some places to start and some ideas to focus on. So, um, and then this, this last piece is really talking about this organizational reflection that I had talked about earlier. So what, let's really do a deep dive on who we are as, as an organization. Why do, we, why do we work the way we work? If we've had issues with making change or we've, we've kind of been burned by DEAI work before, let's, let's take a minute to, to sit down and, and kind of think about how we can learn from that experience to move forward and not just get really defensive. Um, and then also, how can we use what we've learned to make change? So this particular guide is, involves mostly a lot of kind of discussion and talking. Um, so this is something that can ideally be done by a group of cross, um, cross departmental or your whole staff if you're a smaller museum. Um, but really thinking about, think, think about who are, who are your decision makers, but that decision makers can be from across the organization. And that should be, those should be the people involved in this. The other piece we're talking about the implicit bias discussion guide is is recognizing that we're human, we all have our own biases. And this is something that that we bring to this work, whether we intend to or not. And looking at not only individual biases, but also what is our our organization communicating so to somebody who walks in the door, who goes, comes up from the street that uses a wheelchair and sees, oh my God, there's five steps to get up to the main entrance door. This isn't the place for me. Um, 
that goes in your galleries and goes, well, there's there's stuff on the wall, but it's it's not in my first language. I can't find things that I can read. Um, the font's really small. I'm struggling. Um, so really thinking about about um, who who you want to serve and um, meeting that audience where they are. Um, yes, and just a quick reminder, please do everyone mute. I seems like there might be somebody that's not muted. So if you could please mute your um, audio, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. <clears throat> so I just wanted to hit pause for a minute and just give you all a chance to either type your questions in the chat or um, feel free to, you know, I just told everyone to mute, but feel free to unmute if you do want to ask a question verbally. Um, and I'm just going to scroll back up in the chat and see if there's been any questions while I was talking. Ooh, okay, Jocelyn, thank you for sharing that. We will definitely look into that. Um, yes, we are, we are always constantly also talking about the resource guides in particular and the discussion guides. We're always working to both add new resources and also make sure that pages don't go down. Um, so I will go later this afternoon as soon as this webinar is over and check out that implicit bias discussion page um, where you're having errors. Thank you for letting us know about that. Um, Stephanie, I see, have you feed, received feedback from museums who've used a piece of the toolkit? So um, we did, um, as I mentioned, so we did pilot it with those 20 museums um, in the summer of 2021. Um, and actually, you are you are preempting the next phase of the process, which is um, we're drafting a survey right now that will be looking to send out to any museums um, who are starting to use the toolkit. Um, so we've gotten some feedback from the, the sites in the Bureau, but that also was from a very early prototype version of the toolkit that looks very different than what we've got now. It might have some of the same content, um, but the way it's organized is different. So we're, we're really recognizing that as part of the sustainability that we want to make sure that we're not only getting some feedback on what things look like right now, but also getting some feedback from, from organizations that are different than the ones that we initially piloted at. Um, so if you are interested in that, um, let me just switch over here to the slide that has both my contact information and also the project team email on it. So that email is accessibility excellence, all one word, at pamuseums.org. And um, feel free to email me um, personally or that project team email if you're interested in that. I'm also going to send an email out to um, if you found out about this webinar through our e-blasts that we've been sending out about the project, I will be sending out an invite to the entire list or actually a link to sign up to the survey to that entire list. Um, let me see here. I have a question from Ermin. Am I pronouncing your name right? King? Um, and you're asking, as these are open resources available online, Am I correct in assuming that they're available for use gratis by any organization or is a consultation with your team an essential dimension of using the resources slash toolkit? And you're wondering how we're going to sustain this project financially. Yes. Um, so to answer the first question, yes, everything is available for free. Um, there is is not it's very much designed to be self directed. Um, so there's there's not an element of you need to talk with me or one of the team members about it before you get started. Jump right in. Um, and also, if you um, 
if you're going around the website and notice there are a lot of kind of um, open source disclosures on the website um, that this is all under Creative Commons license. So you are more than welcome to modify, change however you need to. Um, answering your question about how we're going to sustain the project financially. So um, without getting into too much detail, yes, the grant has ended. Um, the all of the resources are hosted on PA Museum's website. So we're we're really grateful for that partnership and in, in helping keep that piece up and running. So as long as PA Museums has a website, this will be up and available with it. Um, as far as for continuing how to sustain things, um, because of the partnership that we have with the Bureau of Historic Sites and Museums, um, they obviously have a very vested interest in the project and um, a lot of their staff members are doing this sort of work as as their daily work um so a lot of um it might be maybe someone in that office is going to be the the future partner or the future kind of main point of contact um, multiple people do answer that accessibility excellence at pamuseums.org email um so you might you might hear from me if you if you email a question or um, email that address um, or you might hear from somebody else on the team. There, there are multiple people that are still um, kind of working on this, doing research on resources, um, adding new things to the site, fixing links, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, just a comment here from Jim Bourne. We found that an important and easy to implement is communicating your accessibility features and issues to visit before they arrive. Yes, 100%. Um, we actually have, have a whole section on um, that I haven't really dug into in too much detail, but talking about how accessible is your website? How are visitors going, how are visitors finding you? And is that accessible? Um, do you have an accessibility page that's, that's part of your visit page? So when you click on, on visit us or about us in your, on your website, are they gonna see something that says, you know, hey, we have steps or, hey, we're a historic building, we don't have an elevator. Um, or, you know, here's an accessibility map right here, easily available to download online before you even walk through the door. Um, we talk about this a lot in, um, not sure which resource guide it is. I wanna say it might be accessible communication. Janet, I bet you can feel free to sound off on that. Um, but we do talk this about this in multiple resource guides. Um, but yes, agree, that is that is incredible, important and useful feedback that, that we found. And I think it bears constant repeating. So we've got about, about 10 more minutes. Any other comments? Or I can also kind of open up the, stop sharing the, PowerPoint and just kind of show some some things in the website that looking at at people's um, information and what we're what we're looking at like I'm, I'm looking at Daphne's comment about thinking about different types of barriers and how to take action with limited resources. Um, <clears throat> Ooh, okay, Jana, I like your comment. So list, if, if, if everybody is, is comfortable with this, um, if you wanna list one thing that you have done about accessibility, and feel free to just put that in the chat. I might, might call it a few or talk a little bit more about that. Um, Kate Clifford is asking, is there a way to have multiple sites combine their assessments to see an aggregate of the results? Really good question. So yes, I'm actually going to, to stop sharing and I'll pull up the website and show you how you can do that. So here we are at the website and if you go to the maturity models and workbook page, that will show you not only the PDF 
listings of all of the different workshop or all of the different maturity models. But there is also this link here that says all maturity models that is a word document so you can see all of them at once. Um, and that is that's the way that you can you can kind of look at everything. Um, something that we, we did find I will warn you that that document is I think at least 30 pages long it's very large. Um, but so just just keep that in mind as you will see a larger file. Um, but making sure that um, when when you're looking at these things, um, we, we try to kind of make it not be a checklist of okay yep we check the thing um and we've we've done it are we not we're recognizing that there's a lot of shades of gray involved in this and so it might be something we're really recognizing that when you're filling this out having a discussion about it rather than just kind of filling out like a checklist can be really useful um because that allows that 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 kind of more open discussion of well it says here you know we're talking about um is our entrance accessible and okay well you know we've we've got we've got automatically open doors but what happens if we have a power outage Should we have a system in place for that so um getting getting different perspectives in that yes janet i see you have your hand up go for it sure um so for um kate's question about an aggregate of multiple sites i'm thinking if it's within your own system, you can take like the maturity model spreadsheet and um, you know combine them into one spreadsheet possibly to you know create like formulas to sort of see uh, what we found when we've been doing work with other outside institutions is that they don't necessarily want to share their information with other people so across different museums. Um, you know, obviously it's a little hard to, you know, show your underbelly to each other. So chances are we're not going to see that kind of thing, but we are hoping to get some self-reporting by asking specific questions um, as we start doing like surveys over time to see how things are going um, with the people who are using it. So. Um, it's kind of a yes and no, <laughs> but but if your organization has multiple sites, like for us at PHMC, we're going to be able to see the results of all our own sites, and so we will be doing reporting to our higher ups because obviously we're accountable to the governor, and they want to know <laughs> how we're doing. Um, you know, so it's uh, something that within an ecosystem. You can certainly pull that together through the maturity model since it's an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, or sorry, I mean the word document. Yeah, and it, it's it's something that I will say we have not. Our the the original thought was this would be done by single organizations, um, but I think there there are definitely ways to to combine that out. And I think if you as you're working through it, Kate. If you have any feedback for us on ways that ways that might be more useful, um, no, yeah, that's action. Yeah, I mean, I think. Sorry, Jen, I was talking about the action plan template too, and that's that might be our solution. Who knows? Um, but yeah, that that is something that we. Sorry, I I got I got hung up on different types of maturity models and didn't fully understand your question. <laughs> so thanks for thanks for um, helping me out on that, Janet. Um, okay, yeah, Jim, I have a question, see your question about accessing the recording of the session and sharing the video. Um, so as we kind of get to the end and wrap up is that um, we will be, um, this is recording, we will be sharing this out on the PA Museum's website. So it'll probably be, I'm guessing as a blog post that shows up both on the PA Museum's homepage and also on the accessibility excellence page sidebar. Um, because you're all registered, I will also be sending the link to the um, recording to everyone who's registered. So even if there were people who had registered but aren't able to join us today, um, we'll be sharing out that, that link with them as well. So. <clears throat> Perfect. 
All right. Well, thank you so, so much, everybody. Um, I really appreciate you all taking the time to join today and, and learn more about the project. And again, I would love to hear, hear from you on any questions, comments, links you find that don't work on the website. Um, we're open to everything. And again, I'm just going to post the project email in the chat. But again, thank you for showing up and um, we will be doing another webinar coming up in February that will be um, focusing on our series of blog posts that we've developed. So we do have some of those available. If you go on the right hand sidebar, you'll see recent posts and it will list a number of the topics that we've kind of started doing some deep dive on, deep dives on, um, talking about how to partner with regional ADA centers, which are a little different than centers for independent living. Um, we're working on something now that does a deep dive into website accessibility. So if you kind of take a look at those or, or have some really kind of specific questions that you want to have a more informal conversation with us about, um, that will be the next webinar, which will be February 16th at the same time. That's 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your week and really appreciate you joining for this. Bye now. <laughs>